The Provoke Podcast, brought to you by Provoke Media and produced by the international broadcast specialist, Marketeers. Welcome, everyone, to the Provoke Media Podcast. My name is Arun Sudharman. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the state of technology storytelling in Asia. We're running this podcast with Allison and Partners, and joining us is Jeremy Xiao, who's the Managing Director for Growth and Innovation at Allison and Partners Asia Pacific. Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Arun. It's good to be here. It's good to be on it. Uh, excellent. Also joining us, uh, also in Singapore, is Eileen Yu, who is a very experienced independent technology journalist who's worked for ZNet, Computer Times, and Computer World, among others. Eileen, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay, so let's get into this discussion because it's a very interesting topic. It's a very broad topic as well. The, the whole idea of technology news has changed a lot over the last two decades. I think we've all been, we're all aware of this. We've all been around for the past two decades. Technology was once a, a specialization, a niche, um, a vertical, but now it seems like everything is technology uh, and technology is everything. Tech brands are involved in, in across the board, you know, across the spectrum of stories, whether it's policy issues, whether it's geopolitical tensions, security breaches, you know, even things like workplace culture, staff benefits become front page news these days. Um, so we're going to talk about that shift from perhaps niche, from specialization to mainstream, what it means for brands, big and small, what it means for journalists, what it means for communicators, and what it means for uh, the very concept um, of technology news. Um, so, Eileen, I wonder if we could start you know, on, on that note um, with the idea of, of technology news and how that has changed. Um, we've seen the scope expand and, and evolve over the last two over the last two decades. Um, how do you see the differences in terms of what you've experienced, in terms of how tech brands are communicating their news to media outlets and to the public? Uh, in the last two decades, um, I guess when I first started out in 1998, the, there were quite a lot more media events, briefings, and that's really how the tech vendors would reach out to the media. Um, so, and these were pretty big media briefings, conferences to talk about the technology, um, how they are pitching their solutions to the industry. But of course, over the, the, the last two decades, we've seen the media industry kind of um, shrink a little bit. Um, so they've actually moved, a lot of them moved on to um, pitching more one-on-one -on -one interviews. So more focused on what the media platform itself wants or um, targets. So they would most likely kind of know, for instance, if I'm writing for ZDNet, they would know that I would look at current news um, developments uh, that, and I'm focused on the Asia Pacific region, they'll focus that um, the news pitched to me as well in terms of um, spokesperson that would then have a uh, deeper insight on the region. And I think that's, that's really how the, the most significant kind of change in the last two decades um, in part, probably because of um, the way the media industry has kind of uh, evolved as well. Um, and we see a lot of things like embargo information being offered as well. Um, a lot of relationship building with the journalists. So more one-on-one -on -one kind of um, engagement, I, I guess, would pe be the most significant change I've noticed. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a very interesting point. And, and ha just staying on this, how... Have you seen a kind of overall shift in the scope? So if we if we think about tech brands being quite focused on on the tech media, do you see a, a broader approach from from technology companies these days when it comes to you know wider mainstream issues? Um, I kind of specialize in business technology, which is uh, I would say a little bit different from I guess consumer consumer technology. Um, which I, I guess you would put it as more mainstream. So I I don't know if, I think it's a little different the way then the stories are pitched to an enterprise technology journalist compared to a consumer. 
I think consumer is more social influencer type of um, engagement. Bloggers, uh, more lifestyle angling of stories. I, I I think I think I guess Jeremy can help um, with his feedback um, on this. But obviously, a lot of the outreach has been has kind of shifted a little bit to social media. Um, so the brands themselves are taking on things like Twitter and Facebook to to announce to make announcements as well, um, rather than just talking to media um, and and they're also starting to put out a lot more custom content uh, or marketing content uh, in a way that may not always be obviously um, tagged as like an editorial or a, a branded content, but they will still want to focus on the, this very um, overused word called thought leadership article. So they will write, they will write articles like that and, and use that to kind of um, discuss the technology that they are involved in. Mm. Yes, it, well, two points there that I think we, we will we will discuss. Um, one is it, it sounds like still very much um, a strong role for you know the business technology, enterprise technology, journalism um, versus the kind of specialist consumer tech media. Uh, and secondly, the the role of of custom content. Jem, over to you now. Obviously, you, you've you've this is an, an area that you've researched. What kind of changes have you seen uh, in terms of how uh, tech brands are communicating their news to the media and to the public? So Arun, a couple of things, right? I mean, one of the things that um, talking to clients and talking to brand marketers, there's, there's, there's a tension that we see between the need, do we tell the brand story and the impact what the brand is doing from its mission values and what they're trying to achieve with their solutions? And then there's the product story, right? Is this bigger, smaller, faster, you know, that kind of specs perspective. And I think that, you know, I actually see there are at least two areas where we work with clients through. The first one is um, how much of a brand story they really need to communicate in order to influence decision makers. And, and, and we're seeing that definitely from a B2B perspective, they're still a lot of our clients and a lot of brand marketers realizing the need for a B2B brand to tell their brand story a lot more, right? Just to talk about the imp- what they are trying to do with their technology, a bigger problem they're trying to solve, right? Um, the impact of what that piece of technology would have on customers and communities. So that is what we're seeing quite a fair bit from B2B brands. Con- from the consumer side, from a B two C perspective, you know th- there there is obviously a need to talk about products and specs, not as much as before, but you know it's, it needs to be. We're seeing actually even consumer tech are, are realizing the need to tell that brand story. One is because um, if I could just spend a little more time to unpeel this and further, one is because consumers today are a lot more, um, I would say, a lot more discerning around the technology that they buy. From a consumer perspective, you know, uh, you're not going to impress um, a consumer on a thinner, faster mobile device anymore. You know, and, and it's really around, um, especially when you start thinking about emerged markets or established markets compared to emerging markets, there's also the depth level of exposure consumers have to brands and what they're trying to do. So, long story short, I think it's about for consumer brands realizing that just because you say you got quicker, faster, slimmer, whatever the nice things are about the product is not going to win consumers anymore. And so you need to talk about the overall impact on supply chain and what you're trying to do as a brand, what you're trying to do with employees and your ecosystem. So I think there's a lot more complexity in trying to convince um, consumers. And last but not least, let's not forget the importance of the the role of the journalists today. Actually, you know, I think that what we're seeing as well is journalists are telling us, hey, you're not going to telling brands, you're not going to be able to, to, to sell that fluff to consumers and certainly not going to sell that fluff to us as well, right? So they're asking harder questions. They're asking bigger questions that require And I actually think that I see this as what Eileen talked about as well is, you know, the need to do more one-on-ones because I, I actually think that the, the, the questions that journalists are asking brand marketers today are harder and a lot more thorough and thoughtful because uh, smaller, thinner, <laughs> just doesn't work anymore. Mm-hmm. 
Eileen, how do you how do you view that final point? Do you see a, a continued uh, separation, for example, between technology journalism and mainstream uh, news journalism? Um, do you see, for example, tech journalists are asking those harder questions of technology brands, or, or do or do you perhaps see both types of journalism merging? Um, whether investigative journalism is merging with general journalism, uh, tech, technology journalism um, merging with kind of mainstream news, given you know shrinking newsrooms, um, how do you see the state of technology journalism in that light? uh i don't i don't i'm not quite sure whether this is just my personal view i, I guess jeremy can definitely come in and, and see what um let us know what he observes but i i feel like business technology might be a little bit different because um the i guess the background the the mechanics behind business technology might be a little bit different from uh, a general news a general consumer tech um it's not really about bigger smaller or um, nicer screen or um, nicer cameras is really about um, business strategies, um, the data centers behind the stuff that powers that that phone, you know, that you're carrying, the screen that you're carrying. So I, I'm not sure if that, that means that um, the journalists that cover business tech will have to ask a different kind of, a different set or different kind of questions um, compared to what a mainstream journalist um, in technology might might have to ask. Um, so that it's not, and what I'm trying to say, long, long story short, is that it's not, um, I don't think it's a black and white kind of answer to your question, um, because of the industry that I play in, it's, it kind of, I feel like it's slightly different from the mainstream mm. type. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true. Do, do you still see um, strong demand for that kind of business technology experience when it comes to... Uh, when it comes to uh, journalism, I mean the the ego in me would like to say yes, but I, I guess again that really is a question that you should be asking someone like Jeremy or a tech brand um, whether they see any val or any value that a business tech journalist offers. I, I would like to think that um, because we know the inner workings or how things work in the background, not sexy stuff, you know, not glimmering nice new phones but the back end stuff that makes things work um if the journalists that know how those stuff work um i'm i'm guessing they may not be as um pervasive as the consumer tech journalists probably fewer of us around um and because we know the history and how it works in the back end that might actually lead to different set of questions that we'll ask um, the tech brands, for instance. Um, so, you know, the OCBC scam, for example, um, to, a gen to a general tech, to a general journalist, it, it will be about life savings being lost, money being lost. Um, and that, that the scam is uh, basically a phishing scam. Someone clicked on the wrong or uh, fake um, SMS that leads to a fake uh, website that then steals their information. But for someone like me, I would want to know why um, the bank didn't prevent the SMS spoofing, for instance, when they could have done that. Um, why were regulations not in place to make sure that the bank actually puts in the anti-spoofing or make sure that they registered um, to prevent S SMS um, um, spoofing, for instance. Um, and, and I would question the mechanics behind what kind of um, detection tools were in place. Were there any in place at all that could have prevented the scans from happening? Um, so I don't know if a, a mainstream journalist, I'm sure they would probably um, post some of those kind of questions, um, but for the more, a little bit more technical stuff, maybe it, that's where hopefully someone like me, my role will come in to ask those kind of questions. Yeah, so asking harder questions often. Um, Jem, how, how do you see the, the value of uh, business technology journalism versus uh, consumer? And have you seen any any changes? I'd like to, to say that, you know, uh, let me just paint out some considerations, right? You know, the the concept of tech journalism um, is extremely important, um, both on the B2C and B2C, uh, B2B front. But before I go that into more, further into details on that, um, one is what we're seeing right now is 
be it a healthcare company, a lifestyle company, even a fintech company, a lot of the brands that we work with all see technology as a big part of their growth and a big part of their future and how technology can help them either leapfrog their competition or disrupt the industry that they're operating, right? So more and more brands, regardless on which sector they are, sees the need to really talk about their technology innovation. That's one. The second of all is whether you're a B2B buyer of technology solutions or a B2C buyer of technology solutions, you know, you, you are definitely a lot more engaged in the buying process than ever before too, right? For example, you know, what we're seeing from a B2B decision maker perspective is that they're more engaged and more research than before than just rely, relying on a uh, IT salesperson to tell them what this ERP solution can change their business. So when you start thinking about that, one is the audience and the prospects that be the uh, technology vendors are selling to a lot more engaged, full stop. And so, you know, definitely having um, what we're seeing, the need to have your customer proposition or your value proposition told in a way that can appeal to potential buyers is a big deal, right? For, for a lot of B2B brands and B2C brands. So long story short, I, I, I'm just going back to the fact is that actually, I, you know, I think that the role of technology journalism, whether it's that you're selling a B2B product or B2C product, it's, it's, it's a lot more crucial than before. Getting a, a journalist to articulate what this value proposition could mean to prospects and, 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 and audiences uh, remains um, really, really important. I, I think where in our research that we saw is a majority of brand marketers still see the, the, the benefits of telling their brand story or their product, product story in earned media. You know, um, that, that, that's a given. And that's why, you know, um, wh why we're really excited to, to, to even have this conversation with Eileen, right? Because I, I actually think that, I know it's a long answer, Arun, but I always just think that actually, you know, it's almost something that I get excited by that the concept of technology storytelling is cutting across a lot more verticals and sectors than ever before. Just to end on this part is, you know, like I, I'm actually seeing that 20 years ago, you don't see a lot of lifestyle companies and you don't see a lot of financial companies talk about the impact of their product or their solution. I think a lot of tech companies did that before. You know, they talk about the impact of the technology, being able to make you smarter or work a little faster and all that. But I, I think that all those elements of storytelling that technology brands were doing 20 years ago are a lot more prevalent in what um, other sectors are doing today. I mean, health tech being the most obvious one. But we're also seeing that play out in other forms of um, consumer products, like what you can do to, to, to improve efficiencies and live a better life and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of things in there, but I would yeah. say it's just an exciting time in general. Yeah, but it's a good, it's a good reminder of, of the kind of continued the value of enterprise technology journalism. And before we talk about custom content, Eileen, just wanted to ask you to, to, to Jem's last point. Do you see uh, or have you seen, uh, you know, this kind of, I suppose, a broadening in the type of stories that fall under uh, the enterprise technology remit? So it may not just be so-called um, traditional technology companies, but, you know, any company nowadays can have a technology story to tell. Is that something that you would agree with? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, technology itself... I mean, it's no longer a, 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 I guess it's no longer a specialized area, right? Technology is such a part of our life now. It touches everything. So naturally, the storytelling then has to evolve uh, to reflect that because now technology is in our healthcare, is in our banking. Um, it's even being used, it's now uh, moving into what we call um, OT sectors like utility, power, water. So it's going to cut across every, I guess, market segment um, out there because of how digital transformation is actually um, pushing across in different um, markets, especially in the last two years because of the pandemic. Um, we've heard this said over and over again. So e-commerce, for instance, supermarkets that you never thought, you know, the mom and pop shop that you never thought um, would ever be on online platforms are now on online platforms, the hawker centers in your next door, uh, in your food court. So like Jeremy's point to his, to his point is that I think every company now, there's no longer that 
differentiation where they say we're not a tech company let's not tell a tech story that's no longer the case right tech touches everything now so and for for me as a journalist is to make sure that i can bring that relevance the so what right so what if um this technology is available what does it matter to me as a consumer or to someone as a business why what value does it bring to me and i think that's what i try to instill in all my articles to kind of answer that question you know why is it relevant to my reader as uh, who is um, maybe a cio or a CISO, uh who cares about security for his company uh, or even to a healthcare provider right why would it matter to someone using their service mm. that's a really good point i mean that whole idea of the so what is i think really what distinguishes um, journalism from, uh, let's say, advertorial or maybe even brand uh, storytelling. So on that point, we are seeing uh, tech brands investing in content marketing. Um, I was speaking to a B2B technology marketer last month, and he was telling me that, you know, they feel like they've had no choice because of, of you know the shrinking of the tech media, but I don't think that's the full story necessarily. I think there's also an element of, of control there um, and being able to, to at least attempt to manage the narrative. Um, but whatever the reasons we're seeing tech brands um, becoming publishers themselves. So how has that changed, I suppose, the kind of storytelling we're seeing? And you know, is it always, I suppose, a positive phenomenon? Um, so, Jem, perhaps I can come to you first. Personally, I feel that not every brand should be a publisher. <laughs> um, but let me tell you why, right? I think there are certain sectors in this industry where consumers and audiences don't necessarily want to hear from. Let me give an example. I think that in general, um, if you're a telco, your service provider, your telco, your bank, um, your audiences, are not going to instantly like you. You know, we're seeing a lot in these sectors where consumers just don't necessarily show that kind of love they have to these brands, you know, uh, as opposed to a lifestyle brand like, you know, sneakers and cameras and all that kind of stuff. So that's one. So for those, you know, if you don't have, for those kinds of companies where you're already starting on a back foot where your audiences might not necessarily love you um, and like you, you know, you really need to think about the, what exactly is the value that you want to provide in, in the way you tell your stories and you build content teams and all that kind of stuff. And I think that, that you know, uh, I, I would tell clients and, and that's what we're seeing, like just because every brand says that they, needs to, they, they should be a publisher, that doesn't mean you need to, right? And because one is what kind of value are you going to bring to those audiences? And, and I think that that big piece is that so what that Eileen talked about as well. I think that, Again, I, I still think that, you know, we're talking about the so what. I think that so what applies to a more discerning audience, uh, a, an audience that uh, all customers or prospects, if you want to call it, they all fall into audiences as far as I'm concerned. You know, like they, 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 they are a lot more engaged. They know the difference. Um, and so if you don't have a good piece to tell something that's different or unique, um, then don't do it, right? So I'm saying that just the craft that we've just spent the last 20 minutes talking about or 25 minutes talking about that, that uh, uh, really need to understand the so what and applying it from a earned media perspective or from a branded storytelling perspective is crucial. And so I, I actually enjoy talking to uh, technology journalists or journalists of any sort when they, you know, when we debate about the so what, because I think that keeps uh, clients and brands that we work with honest and, um, you know, making sure that they're not selling mm. fluff. Yeah, you learn a lot from the questions. Um, Eileen, how effective do you think this or this proliferation of custom content is when it comes to um, technology companies? I I feel like it's it's um, the direction towards custom content is uh, out of um, the desire by brands to want to control the messaging, right? To make sure that the narrative they want. Uh, actually shows up uh, and the keywords that they, they are told to, to put in their messaging actually will show up as well. But uh, like to Jeremy's point, I, I think the difference here is that Jeremy gets it. He's a very experienced um, uh, 
PR rep in the industry, but not everyone gets that, right? Not everyone understands that there's a difference between content that's written by a independent media journalist as opposed to, to content that's written by uh, that comes from a brand. Um, I mean, I mean, consumers are not dumb. They they know, and, and like Jeremy mentioned, they they are starting to ask tough questions, right? They're not just taking somebody's words uh, words for it anymore. So, I, I mean, as a so I'm a freelance journalist. We all know that, and I, I wear two hats. Uh, I write for ZDNet. That that's me as a journalist, and I also write custom content um, articles for for brands themselves. And some brands will get it. They know that it's better to make sure that the content has answers that so what question and not just talk about their products and talk about uh, how great they are compared to their competitors. They know that what's important is um, to discussion about um, technology trends, the issues that are concerning um, CXOs today. Uh, I, I think those are the better brand, brands who actually get, get it. You know, they understand, but sometimes the brands don't get it and that's where the problem comes in where Jeremy mentioned about how um, some brands just shouldn't be publishers because they don't understand the value behind um, strong content and not just content that you like because you're you're the the brand behind the content yeah it's co content for the sake of it and I really I just want to add another point right if you if you don't mind I I, I think that even if a brand decide to be a creator of content um again if the if the content doesn't address the so what um there's no guarantee that people are going to read it <laughs> there's no guarantee that the content will travel as well right which brings bring, bring the other part of um the world of content marketing content marketing in my opinion is you create the content but you need to figure out how to distribute and get that the content to the hands of consumers as well right so i i think that those are are, are, are things as well that that brands and, and marketers need to kind of understand as well it's just because you publish that doesn't mean that it's gonna get read right and I, and I think it still boils down to the only way it can get read the only way they can get distributed and the only way they can get reshared is one is it needs to address the so what factor it needs to understand or, or deliver that value from a readership perspective you know and and it needs to be timely right i mean like um you know it needs to address the, the concerns of today I, you know, I always joke about this. I mean, it's just a separate tangent. But I remember the first day of of university, I attended the, my class for journalism, and and back then it was, uh, you know, the the lecturer wrote it on a blackboard. He said, "What makes news? You know, uh, dog bites man or man bites dog, right?" <laughs> and just to say, like, you know, again, guys, remember, like, that. So what is today? The only news that we make is chances are man bites dog probably make more news than dog bites man. So it's really around reminding um, why it's news to begin with. It's, it's different from yesterday and it's new, right? Well, unless you got bike somewhere uh, in the nether regions. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, then, then, that's then still I new. Gonna, yeah, I don't know whether it's going to appear in the, the, the newspapers that CSOs and uh, uh, CSOs will be reading. If it does, I'm kind of concerned about that publication. Well, it might, well, it might get on LinkedIn these days because, you know, you see a lot of stuff on yeah. LinkedIn. But actually, it kind of brings me to my next point, which is, yes, I, I think we, we all agree, right, that um, news value earned media value is so critical. Uh, and, and you can't get to that unless you address the real questions. But what we what we also know, I think, is that you can spend a lot of money um, to distribute content, to promote it, to make it more visible. There are platforms like LinkedIn, where it can sometimes be difficult to tell what is earned and what is paid. Um, and you can create, you know, a huge amount of visibility for a story um, without it necessarily earning that kind of attention or engagement. And I wonder if either of you see that dynamic um, changing the way that tech brands tell stories. And, and do, you, do you see that as, as something of, of some concern at all? That there's no clear line. What is? Uh... Yeah. Well, that, that there is no clear line, and that you can, you can now. I think, um, you can, you can make a story in, in incredibly visible uh, purely by putting money behind it. If I, I I guess it depends on the content. I 
I'm not going to, I'm not going to diss uh, a content just because it came originally from a brand, uh, for instance, it, it really goes back to the content, the meat of it, right? And how, um, I'm not going to assume that everything that they put in that content is accurate and factual. Um, and I think if somebody reads the content, I know that it's, it's hosted on um, the brand's website. You know, there's always this inevitable level of skepticism when they read that piece of content because they know where it came from. So now if you're going to get someone to write it and then not, um, not say that it was a commission article, for instance, um, and post it somewhere on a, a more neutral platform, um, then I guess, you know, whether there's a line blurring of sorts going there, it, for me, it really boils down to the information. Is it factual? Is it serving any value? Um, then it, it doesn't really matter to me um, who wrote it uh, or who endorsed it. If the article was commissioned stealthily by a, a brand, but the article itself or the content itself didn't actually outwardly, it, it's not blatant, right? It, it doesn't talk about products. It doesn't talk about uh, a piece of solution. If it talks about issues, industry um, developments that is important and critical for a CXO to, to know about, then it, by its own, that content itself carries some value. Um, so it, it really, it, it goes down again to the value of the content um, and whether it meets that purpose. So there are some tech brands, because their ecosystem is so large, it's big enough, and they play across different market segments, and they have enough money, deep pockets to invest in a content strategy where a portal itself, um, you know, they create a portal just to carry content. Now, would that be custom content, you would ask? Um, because it doesn't outwardly market a product that they sell, but it talks about industry trends and, that, and, and, and the ecosystem that they play in. Um, so. I mean, the blurring of the line gets grayer and grayer as, as you go, um, as you look at different um, content providers and different content platforms. So, and I think when that happens, it really goes back to the so what question um, and the meat of content. Yeah, good good point, Jem. How do you see the um, the kind of role when it comes to the, you know paid media um, blurring the lines? Do you see that changing the, the nature of brand storytelling? I, I don't see that changing or blurring the lines with brand storytelling, I, I, but I, I still maintain and we're definitely seeing that audiences are a lot more discerning and doesn't matter if they, it's a paid story or not, they'll still ask, so what, right? Is this, is, is, this, is this too much fluff in there? Is it too much chess beating? Is this real? And I think that, you know, because consumers and audiences and, and, and B2B tech buyers, et cetera, across the board, are so aware and so involved in reading of news because they've read all these news for such a long time that I still maintain the fact that they're a lot more discerning, right? And because of that, what is, so let's put it this way, you could be starting um, doing a chess beating piece on a paid sponsored story and your consumers will still go like, yeah, you know, I don't believe a single thing these guys said, whether it's paid or earned or whatever. So, I, I still think that the, the the need to respect the audience is the first step, or at least respect their 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 the level of knowledge that they have. Um, that's important. But that said, you know, one more thing, Arun, I probably want to say that was definitely seeing as well is, you know, I'm being able to see that a lot of brands have, um, at least from a paid or sponsored stories perspective, spend more time and effort in using those vehicles will also talk about their values and your purpose, you know, really taking, a, a, taking you know, these, these sponsored stories to three really tackle issues based type of communications as well, because, you know, that needs a little more delicate balance to it. And, and obviously I know my journalist friends would say, because they want to control the message. I don't just think about control the message. It's, it's about, it's it, sorry, Eileen. You said it just now, so, but you know, it's, it's really taking a more delicate approach in trying to address some of these concerns, right? And I, I and, and Arun, when you started this podcast, you you also raised the fact that tech today cuts across everything from policy issues 
uh, to even government to government relations as well, right? I mean, you know, Asia is a unique place. I I, I love how, you know, uh, Asian governments are also using uh, technology companies from their country as an indication of that nation's success. You know, um, I actually see a lot of it being done in Asia as compared to Europe and in North America. You know, the, the alignment between tech companies and the governments that they are, with the countries that they're from, is also another thing, right? So where am I going with this? I, I think that, you know, that sponsored piece allows um, brands to really tackle some of the more delicate issues and really kind of articulate the, the so what, uh, especially if it leads a lot more illustration and a lot more explaining. But at the same time, you know, just making sure that they, they tell a, a bigger story and the story that, that they are really impacting countries and communities etc so the big stuff as well yeah yeah i think hopefully there's an understanding that even if content is paid for if it's not interesting and credible it's not going to be very effective um that's what you hope anyway so final question and probably one we'll need to answer reasonably quickly because we, we we are I'm, I'm aware both of you are quite busy so um have either of you observed any notable trends in tech storytelling um, that are particularly specific to the Asian region uh, as compared to North America or Europe? Um, so, Jim, perhaps you want to take that first? You know, one thing that we're definitely seeing is, uh, especially in our research, is um, close to 70% of B2B and B2C technology marketers and communicators feel that they need to tell a lot more brand storytelling as a pet compared to product stories, right? Uh, I think that for a lot of tech companies in this part of the world, um, it's really establishing the role that they play in nation building and economic development, et cetera. So, you know, when we, when we pull B2B decision makers and, and B2C decision makers, that's one thing that's a lot more clearer is definitely more of them in this part of the world compared to the West see the need to tell brand stories, right? And they will do so regardless of whether it's on earned channels or sponsored stories or co because again, it's just to drive recall and repetition, uh, repetitional re uh, recall to their, their audiences on the role that they play in this region. So I think that's something that it's quite clear. You know, I, I actually think that was, I mean, I think I see a lot less of that happening in the US and UK, for example, where we actually seeing a lot more product driven type of stories rather than that brand vision, mission, values type of stories in this part of the world. Mm, sure. Why do you think okay. that's the Jeremy? Do, do you have a theory for it? Sorry, what, what do you say, Ilium? Why do why, I think that's the case? Why do you think that's the case? Yeah, I mean, why why were the US brands, uh, why are they focusing more on products when the Asia ones are focusing more on brand awareness and brand building? I think there are like two areas to look at. I mean, one is um, a lot of Western companies are still fairly new in this part of the world. You know, that, that they, they might be known in your home country and they're doing a really good job in there, but to a lot of audiences in this part of the world, they're still fairly new. So that's one potential area that, that's why that brand piece uh, has to play out. Um, the second piece is boils down to, um, we're seeing that because the Asian audiences, whether they're buying of B2B or B2C services are a lot more plugged in from a technology perspective and understanding what technology will mean, they're a lot more discerning. So I think it's a both, right? They, 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 they care more about, Yes, there's also a smaller chip, slimmer phone and all that kind of stuff. But what, where is this coming from, right? Uh, is, is, does, does this company treat their, their ecosystem well? You know, are there a bunch of uh, Western countries that's kind of take over and change the way we Asians kind of live? I, I don't want to get too much into the, the East versus West piece. I, I almost think that that's a separate topic on its own. But I think that those are the two areas that we're seeing, right? So again, I, I meant it today, do not, uh, discount uh, how much uh, your audience cares about the stories that you tell and how, how well they know how, how much they're going to call your bluff. Eileen, anything from you in terms of, of, of how you see tech um, brands communicating in Asia versus other regions? You know, in the past couple of years, I think for quite obvious reasons, it's been very um, um, nationalistic and politics driven, social, social issues 
social political issues are driving a lot of the conversation that's happening. Um, I, I think we all know uh, <laughs> uh, why that is, I think. Um, and so I think, I think that's the, what I've been seeing because I obviously write for ZDNet from an Asia point of view, but there are, ZDNet also has uh, bloggers um, in the US, uh, in Europe as well, writing. And, and I think that's, that's the very, I think to Jeremy's point, yes, it's quite a lot of focus on product, um, yes. Um, and I suspect that's probably because the readers want that. Um, and also a lot of, a lot of it is social, political issue driven, even though we're a tech media platform, right? But it, it affects quite a bit of how technology um, develops and evolves and how brands want to be seen in connection with those social, political re- uh, issues. So even things like sustainability, for instance, you know, um, being pro um, green, um, for instance, those things are coming out a lot more now in, in discussions and, and brands want to be seen to be on the, um, the, the right side, whatever that side might be for that moment in time for the month. Um, so that's what I see has been driving a lot of conversations. Um, inclusivity, social media has, social media platforms have really given these brands a, a way to, to project those um, conversations and where they stand. And, and back to Jeremy's yeah. point, right? There is nothing wrong with wanting to manage the narrative on the brand side. I mean, they are still trying to manage their brand. And I think if they want to make sure that the the messaging gets across accurately or, or to, to what they perceive as important, then they will want to be able to manage uh, or control them, that narrative. There's nothing wrong in that. Um, it's just it's just that the consumer then would just need to be more discerning. And they are discerning, as Jeremy said. They are very discerning now. And they will just read as much as they want to read and make a decision based on what is available out there. Whether or not it's a custom content, a brand content, or a, or a content that is produced by a media platform. Mm. Yeah, well, it all adds up to, you know, a very fertile area, I think, given all the trends both of you have, have raised during this discussion. The state of technology story, storytelling in Asia is not just about technology. Um, and what's interesting also beyond, I guess, if you could flip it around and you could say the state of storytelling in Asia is increasingly about technology. So both things perhaps are true. So anyway, thank you both so much um, for your time today. I found that as a really fascinating conversation. Um, and hopefully we'll get you back on the podcast at some point in the future. Thank you both. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Arun. You've been listening to the Provoke podcast, brought to you by Provoke Media and produced by the international broadcast specialist, Marketeers.